So normally the most common type of disc prolapse that we see is a posterolateral disc herniation. And for that, a typical microdiscectomy, which can be either a tubular, an open, or an endoscopic would be the way to go. I am dealing with special situations where routinely I don't do microdiscectomies. And that's why I thought that it might be worthwhile going ahead of the other two talks. Besides, of course, there are some other commitments. So we are going to talk about special situations. Let's jump in case number one. 43 year old male, sedentary job, no medical comorbidities, had grumbling back pain for three months, onset of severe back pain for the past three days, bilateral buttock pain. There were no other radicular symptoms such as leg pain, paresthesia, etc. No bladder bowel complaint. Patient was unable to lie down comfortably, sit, stand or walk. On examination, there was a forward stoop posture with flexed hips and knees, loss of lumbar lordosis, a severe spasm. SLR caused severe back pain, not leg pain. And SIST hips pulses were normal. The patient on MRI had a huge central lumbar disc prolapse. When you say massive central disc herniation, you mean that the canal occupancy by the disc is more than 50%. And when you say central, it means the apex of the herniation is in the midline posteriorly. Typically, central lumbar disc herniations are common in the slightly younger age group, in people with a high body mass index, and in occupations which typically involve heavy lifting. We divide them into two types, the ones which are extruded or sequestrated where the whole disc has come out beyond the PLL and is in the canal or a contained lumbar disc herniation which is contained by the posterior fibers of the annulus. This is usually less than 50%. The typical complaints here are back pain, unilateral or bilateral radiculopathy. Please mark that in spite of this, the Corda equina syndrome incidence is only 6% even in huge central disc herniations. Our treatment options are non-operative epidural injection and surgery. As Samir mentioned some time back, most patients of lumbar disc herniation, even these large central disc herniations, respond brilliantly to non-operative treatment. At two-year follow-up, usually the, if you do an MRI, there is a significant reduction in the size of the herniation. In some series, is like the CRIPS series, there has been a complete resolution of the herniation in 14 out of 15 patients. Most importantly, for a lot of orthopedic surgeons, none of the patients progress to develop a significant neurology or a corda equina syndrome. So we often frighten the patient, and we not because we want to frighten the patient, but we ourselves are frightened. Okay, what is going to happen? Is this patient going to progress to a disc herniation or neurologic deficit? I want to avoid it. So you try to tell the patient that you are going to develop a neurologic deficit, better to do surgery. And this is not necessarily true. What about surgery? When should you do in a central disc prolapse? Neurologic deficit, failure of symptom resolution, or inability to tolerate the severe pain the patient has. The surgical options are basically either you do a discectomy alone by whichever method you would prefer, or a discectomy and fusion. Of course, discectomy is preferred because it's a smaller procedure, less muscle dissection, less blood loss, less risk of infection, early, faster pain, uh, post-operative pain uh, rehabilitation. But the disadvantages which are purportedly said are that when you're doing a large central disc herniation, it is difficult to retract the neural bulk and therefore the risk of neurological injury. Because there is a large rent in the annulus from which the, the disc has prolapsed, there is a higher risk of recurrent disc prolapse. Often these large uh, disc prolapses, especially the, the ones which occur in adolescents and young adults, are accompanied by end plate avulsions. The risk of residual low back pain because there is a large annulus defect and a larger volume of herniated disc and the risk of post-operative instability because when you are trying to operate on these patients, you may create instability. Arvind Kulkarni from the, Global, uh, from the Bombay Hospital had published this article in 2019 on 83 patients of central disc prolapse and he had reported 85% excellent outcomes with discectomy alone. Fusion he recommended was only pre for pre-existing instability, severe degenerative changes. What is my approach for central disc herniation? Non-operative treatment is the primary treatment in the absence of significant deficit. 
when you are doing a surgery for these type of large central disc herniations which come out in the midline i prefer to go through a standard open midline discect laminectomy and discectomy if it is slightly towards more towards one side and if i feel it can be easily at reached from one side i will do a hemilaminectomy here generally when you do a typical lumbar canal stenosis decompression you do a trumpet decompression you undercut the facet joints here you can't undercut because you want to reach laterally so you have to actually cut the medial facet like this vertically down once you've cut this I usually take a high speed drill to thin out the lamina because if you use in this kind of a tight canal, you put in kerosene punches, that may be enough to cause a postoperative deficit. Once you've reached the laterally and you've seen the annulus, even then it is very different, difficult to retract the neural structures. So I generally do a lateral laminotomy that reduces the intradiscal pressure, do a little bit of discectomy from the side. I even irrigate from there so that any loose fragment comes out this then reduces the pressure and allows me to retract the neural structures a bit more easily through across the central disc prolapse <laughs> try to tease the central disc fragment with a blunt hook because if you try to remove it directly that it is usually stuck somewhere there is a higher risk that you the disc will get shredded and you will leave some disc behind because you will not be able to remove the whole thing or there is a higher risk of dural tears. I do not routinely add fusions to my discectomy procedure. I do it if there is an instability, if there are accompanying type 2 modic changes or a large end plate avalanche as seen on a CT scan. And if fusion in these patients, I prefer a TLF approach. This current patient of ours was treated non-operatively. You can see nine months later, there is a significant resolution of the disc prolapse. Patient went on to recover pain-wise, weakness was, there was no weakness, of course, but no bladder bowel devil complaints developed. The second type of problem that you see are lateral lumbar disc herniations. So here is a 39-year-old male, no medical comorbidities, severe pain in the back, radiating down the left leg along the anterior thigh for three weeks. Lot of paresthesias, dysesthesias, burning and numbness in the same distribution, feeling of hot and cold, pain increases with standing and walking. There was tenderness of the lumbar spine, flexion and extension both were reduced. Spre femoral stretch test was positive. SLR and sacroiliac stretch tests were negative. There was weakness in the quads. Sensory loss was left uh, of in, within the left L3 dermatome. This was the MRI picture. You can see that the disc has come out and it's not in the typical postrolateral, which would have been slightly medial over here in the lateral subarticular zone. This is a foraminal disc herniation. So lateral lumbar disc herniations constitute about 3 to 10% of lumbar disc herniations. They typically occur in the slightly older age group in the 55 to 80 years old. They can be classified as what are called as foraminal, like the one I showed right now, the red would recover, be foraminal or it can be outside the line of the facet joint in which it is called as extra foraminal disc herniations. Most of the times the disc which prolapses is either L4-5 or L3-4. When an L4-5 disc prolapses far laterally out here, then it takes out the exiting nerve root, not the root which is traversing here. In a posterolateral disc, if it's 4-5, the nerve root which will be irritated will be the L5 nerve root. In an L4-5 paralateral disc, the nerve root which will be take irritated will be the L4 root. And you should be aware of this. And patients typically have, ex there is very little room over here. It's a small area from which the nerve root is going out. If the disc comes out here, the nerve root is pretty squashed and patient gets severe unrelenting pain. They are not really able to tolerate that pain. Along with the pain, they often, as I said, dysesthesia because this is the area of the dorsal root ganglion. The ganglion gets irritated and therefore you get autonomic symptoms too. How should we proceed in these patients? Non-operative root block or surgery. Because of the severe pain the patient has, often the patient tells you to go for surgery or you are tempted to give the do surgery because you feel you can't see the patient's pain and you come under pressure. But the honest answer is, even in these patients, about 70% of patients will respond to non-operative treatment adequately done. 
and Preeti will be happy to know that excellent results with either a fluoroscopy or a CT guided root block injection. At one month, 89% of the patients had decreased radicular leg pain and most patients eventually result, uh, return to normal activities. If you are going for surgery, your options are that you would do a discectomy alone, you would do a discectomy with fusion, and you could use various aids to do your discectomy. You could use a microscope, you could use a microendoscope with tubular retractors, or you can do an endoscopy. In fact, this is one place where I feel a foraminal epidural, foraminal endoscopic surgery is a brilliant solution to the problem because the disc is right there in front of you. But if you are going through a disc regular discectomy, you're not trained to do endoscopic surgery, then the best way to do is what is called as the Wilsey intratransverse approach. This approach is an intramuscular approach. Patient is in the standard prone position, put two needles at the level of the transverse processes in AP view, take, the, take a shoot and then mark your incision about one finger breadth or one and a half finger breadth lateral to the facet joint and it goes from transverse process to transverse process or from pedicle to pedicle. You then have it go down, cut the deep fascia in the same line and then put in your finger and try to dissect the plane between the multifidus and the longissimus muscles. It's an intramuscular plane. It is not very vascular. You'll reach down, right down onto the transverse processes. Your goal should be to reach the facet joint or the base of the transverse process. What is very useful in this approach is to have a good retractor. I usually use the McCulloch microdiscectomy retractor, but what is better than that is either using the tubular retractor because it locks to the, to the table and gives you that medial inclination and stays in place, or the tubular retractor system has another extension called as the quadrant retractor, which also I find very useful when I do these approaches. Once I have reached the base of the transverse process over there and I can see the facet joint, this is the picture. You can see the transverse process. You trace it down. You can see the lateral pillar of bone and down here. This is the intertransverse membrane that you are seeing over there. Expose the intertransverse membrane. And then what you have to do is start burying out and removing a part of that lateral pillar just at the level of the disc. So this is what you do. You never burr out upwards. Otherwise, you call the lighting defect. You burr out medially about two to three. Minutes. So what I do is I trace the facet joint from here and start burring the lateral part of the facet joint and going here like this, burring this out a little bit so that I get about two to three millimeters of space. Once I've done that, then using a curette, I elevate or separate the intertransverse membrane from the bottom of the transverse process below above and the bottom of the transverse process below and go medially below that area where I have burned out. Take off the intertransverse membrane. You will see a small nerve there. That is not the nerve root. That is the posterior branch of the nerve root. You have to gradually retract that, go slightly medial to that and you'll see the disc herniation. You take off the disc herniation and then at that time you'll be able to see the nerve root. So this is the stepwise procedure that we follow with the we'll see approach. The advantage is it's a direct visualization of the disc prolapse, minimum nerve tissue handling or retraction, minimum bone or soft tissue removal, spinal stability is well maintained. So patient starts walking the same day, a few hours after the surgery can practically go home the same day or the next. The limitation is at L5-S1. In L5-S1, the posterior iliac crest and the PSIS slightly overhangs the L5-S1 region. It's not very difficult to do a L5-S1 discectomy, far lateral discectomy. But if you have to put pedicle screws through this area, it's far more difficult to do that. What is my approach? Root block injections, foraminal epidural injections. If it's a foraminal disc, I still prefer to do an interlaminar fenestration. I just do an interlaminar fenestration, remove a little bit of the kefkefalad lamina right up to the level of the disc and then I can easily pick up the foraminal disc right from there. I don't have to go through the we'll see approach. On the other, if it's an extra foraminal approach, we'll see approach is a far better approach. 
I think posterior lateral endoscopic discectomy for those who can do it is a fantastic option for this and good to excellent results in 80% of patients. Irritation of the dorsal root ganglia results in persistent leg pain and paresthesia. The last case, 38-year-old female, low backache for 15 years, lifted a bucket of water in the morning. She had severe low back pain by afternoon. She had severe pain in both legs. By evening, she was unable to walk. Presented to us in casualty at around 6 p.m. in the evening. Non-tender spine, she had retention of urine. I had to catheterize her. She had about 800 urine of cc of urine. Anal tone was fair. She had grade 0 power in the right e left EHL, T-band, peroneae, grade 1 in the right side. She had some weakness in the quads and the hip flexors. Maybe it was because of the severe pain that she was not able to do it. But she did have anesthesia on the left L45S1 and hyposthesia on the left, uh, on the right side. So this, my friends, would be an acute corda equina syndrome. 86% of patients will have back pain. A number of them will have pain along with tingling, numbness and weakness in one or both the legs. There may be bladder or bowel complaints, reduced sensation in the perineum and gait disturbances are the features of acute corda equina syndrome. The incidence is 1 to 1.5 6 per lakh population. There are three grades of acute corda equina, suspected, incomplete or complete. So this was the x-ray picture on the patient. You can see a slight wedging of the, I think it is the L1 vertebra or the L2, I'm not 100% sure. Anyway, I think it is L2. So you can see multi-level problems here. There is a disc protrusion at the lowermost level, which is L5S1. At L45, there is a sequestered four disc, which has gone upwards. L45, L34, large osteophytes and a disc bulge. L2, disc bulge. L12, disc protrusion with a cyst, which looks at above that. Now, the question here for me was, which level to tackle in this case? Which is the offending level? Which, where should I do my surgery? Should we do further investigations? Should we do non-operative treatment or surgery? This is an acute corda equina syndrome. Patient has presented at 6 in the evening with these complaints. Some people say that if you have multi-level disc prolapses, multiple level root in involvements, you should do EMG nerve conduction. Completely useless to differentiate between various types of nerve root problems and definitely not in an emergency situation. The only help it offers is when you are suspecting a demyelinating disorder like a multiple sclerosis or a Guillain-Barre syndrome where you want you are want to document that. But usually these are painless syndromes and not painful syndromes. What about the role of diagnostic root blocks? More so useful in a non-acute setting, but it helps to differentiate sometimes when you are worried about which is the aff affected nerve root. What about the timing of surgery? Should you do it within 12 hours? Should you do it within 24 hours? Is between one and three days okay? Or can you go after more than three days? And should you in this kind of a patient do decompression alone? Should you fuse their uppermost segment which is going into kyphosis? Or should you do, now that Abai is here, I can talk about dynamic stabilization also in such patients. So, uh, Anne and all did a meta-analysis over here. They said that significantly better outcomes were obtained if the surgery was performed within 48 hours of onset of the syndrome. Even so, patients operated even after 48 hours had recovery in the symptoms quite significantly. Another study which showed that laminectomy or discectomy was done. Majority of the patients were operated within 48 hours and there was a significant improvement in patient symptoms and signs. My approach, I always like to operate the patient as early as possible, preferably if, as early comfortably. I don't want to operate in the middle of night at 2.30 or 3 o'clock, but if I can do so reasonably, this patient who came in at 6 o'clock, we operated at 10.30 in the night and finished it off in the night. I think that's a reasonable approach if you can do it early, but without endangering the patient. You should do the goal of surgery of any disc prolapse. We talk about all these fancy surgeries, microsurgery, endoscopic. Your goal is only one, a good decompression, but safely. Your surgery should not worsen the neurological outcome. 
and therefore do whatever you can if you can manage to do this procedure without endangering the neural structures further then please do so i usually in a corda equina syndrome unless there is a disc which is coming out definitely on one side where i will do a fenestration discectomy if it's a central midline disc and upper lumbar disc i will do a laminectomy with discectomy patients with corda equina syndrome do not respond as well as a regular disc prolapse even the the recovery from pain is not as great as in a regular disc prolapse typically the first thing to improve is the back pain followed by the leg pain the motor power then slant slowly starts improving return of bladder and bowel often takes 2 to 3 months so do not be in a hurry to remove the foley's catheter immediately post op till the patient's power in the leg comes up significantly to grade 3 or so generally the bladder has not recovered and then patient is typically left with numbness for a fairly long time and a little bit of paresthesia thank you very much we got many questions from our What diameter you did for this patient? So I did only I did a L3 and an L4 laminectomy to decompress L4-5 disc basically. That's it. I didn't do anything about. It. And she went on to recover completely on the right side. On the left side, she showed no recovery. The ones on side which she had grade zero power pre-op, she did not recover at all. But her bladder pain went away. Bladder recovered. Bowel recovered. Her uh, right side neurology completely recovered left side was grade zero so i decided on 4 5 because i thought what is the acute event which has happened over here the acute event which happened was the uh, sequestrated disc at 4 5 so rather than tackling something like that cyst which was at higher up which is not something which can happen overnight so that's not what has led to the current problem my problem was to solve her current situation so her current problem originated from the extruded disc at l45 and that's what i tackled